Hey everyone, it's Mr. Blake. Today we're going to be talking about the quantum mechanical model. And this model is the model of the atom that is essentially the most up-to-date. It's the most current model we have. We've been through quite a few, going through Thomson, his raisin bun model or plum pudding model, uh, Ernest Rutherford's uh, attempt at it, and then finally Niels Bohr. And actually Niels Bohr, um, despite sort of getting the, I mentioned this in class, but despite sort of getting the bad rap of having a, an incomplete model with his um, his model of the nucleus in the center with energy levels orbiting, was actually really on the right path and was a big proponent later on in his career um, in a total acceptance of quantum mechanics and quantum physics, unlike some of his contemporaries, uh, which included Albert Einstein. So what is the quantum mechanical model? Uh, essentially, the quantum mechanical model is uh, the idea that Energy, because it can only come in certain amounts or quanta, which we know now is from electrons moving from different energy levels, and those energy levels are spaced unevenly and they're different in different elements. Um, they can only exist, they can only emit energy in what are called quanta. All right? um, <clears throat> so because of that, we know electrons can never really be in between those different energy levels that they have. And we have up to seven energy levels in a given atom uh, and many, many electrons to occupy those levels. The real question is, what does the atom look like? Like, where are those electrons at any given time? And quantum physics gives us some interesting insights. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those insights don't make any sense to us because they're not relatable to anything in our world in terms of obeying the laws of physics that you and I and our vehicles and our friends obey. Uh, things like gravity and all sorts of crazy stuff. And it has a really interesting, there's some really quirky, bizarre things that you hear about, things called interference or quantum entanglement, um, quantum tunneling, all sorts of bizarre stuff. Um, but I would encourage you guys to check out that TED Talk video that I posted on Google Classroom. Uh, because it kind of goes through some of those and a little bit of the history, and it's actually pretty interesting. Um, one of the guys that really sort of um, went a long way in terms of proving the, uh, the this idea of quantum mechanics was a guy named Irvin Schrodinger, um, and he basically took the math end of it. Uh, and even despite all these incredible calculations, I'll show you the equation in a second, um, Albert Einstein was really just incapable of accepting um, this. Uh, his, famous, um, his famous quote is, I cannot believe that God throws dice, meaning that the universe could be so random and um, make so little sense to him that he couldn't understand it conceptually. Uh, but other scientists like Schrodinger and Max Born and um, Heisenberg and Niels Bohr were able to uh, embrace these, uh, these findings from the various experiments that they're performing and kind of build upon it. So he devises this equation, and there it is. That's Schrodinger, and that's his wave equation. Uh, obviously, I have no idea what any of that means. You would need to be a quantum physicist to really break that down. But it's not really the point. What this equation does is that essentially gives us the probable location of where we can find an electron. And this is really at the heart of it, is, and this is what sparked this whole thing, is that experimentally, what they realized, that Bohr's model and all the previous models could never really predict where uh, an electron was at any given time. Uh, and this was uh, Heisenberg's principle. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is what it was called. And what it said is the more you knew about a location of an electron, the less you knew about its uh, velocity or momentum. So this idea that you can't predict where at any point, that electrons are basically in these clouds, and the minute you identify it, you change it. You change its spin, you change its location, you change its momentum. Even by just looking at the electron, any time that it absorbs energy, it's going to move. And so what Schrodinger did with this really complex equation is that he was able to predict where we can find um, these electrons. Not with any certainty, but just with probability. Right? So again, the, the real challenge here was that none of this, when you think about the way an electron works, has any connection to our experience in the real world. Okay? Even though we are made of quantum particles, our computers, our understanding of silicon, our cell phones, uh, the entire modern age is built, it is truly built upon the knowledge of quantum physics that had, this not, had we not gone down this road as a scientific community, 
we would probably be some the same place we were, barring any other developments, um, that we that we were technology wise in the early 1900s. So all of these advances are really because of our uh, understanding of quantum physics. It's just a little bizarre. So. Um, Quantum physics is hard to explain conceptually, but it can be explained. It can, in fact, it can be proven. It's one of the most provable theories out there. It can be proven mathematically. Um, <clears throat> so Bohr was right in one thing, right? We have energy levels. That energy levels exist, um, that electrons cannot exist in between them, but that they simply make leaps or quantum leaps uh, between each of them. All right? What he was wrong about was that the electrons don't simply rotate around the nucleus the same way our planets orbit the sun. Um, it's, in fact, much more complicated than that, okay? Uh, not only because we can't predict, but because two electrons can't be in the same space, in the same orbit, and be spinning in the same direction. And so because of that, this model of simply having rings and just a ton of electrons in the same ring um, doesn't make any sense physically. Okay, so again, what we're looking for is simply the probability, and we have ways to uh, figure that out. Okay, we have ways to not necessarily uh, visualize it, although we can. Um, we'll never know exactly where any of those electrons are at any given point, but we've, through the Schrodinger wave equation, figured out um, what these electron clouds look like. Um, and it's a lot of complex math, um, but it's allowed us to do some great things. So the quantum mechanical model says. It's impossible to pinpoint, but you can get the probability. So what we're, what we're going to do with this, we're not going to get bogged down in the physics or the sort of the mystery or the mysticism of quantum physics. But what we want to be able to do is be given an atom and be able to list where we can find those electrons um, by using something called quantum numbers. Okay, so we're, And again, I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. I'm not going to make you know what the variables are or uh, for each of the quantum numbers, but I want you to sort of understand what each of them means and what each of them is describing to us. Right, pretty important. So this, again, this was the old way, right? This was the Bohr model. You had the nucleus. Uh, thanks to Ernest Rutherford, we, we know where the nucleus is. We know it's very small and very dense, and we know that the electrons are around it. And the old school way was two electrons in the first ring, eight electrons, and then you just built out from that. In fact, some biology classes, maybe in junior high, hopefully not our school, um, is probably teaching you exactly this. But that was wrong. That wasn't the complete truth. This is a good model. This is a valid model for explaining a lot of things. It helps us understand energy levels. Um, it just doesn't help us get the true sense of electron behavior and movement around an atom. Right? So the first quantum number is one that we've already been dealing with. It's the energy level. Okay? So we have up to seven energy levels. Some of our largest atoms go uh, seven energy levels. And with each energy level, we are getting farther and farther away from the nucleus. So this quantum number describes how far away from the nucleus we are. Remember, it takes more energy. On, on average, it takes more energy to be farther away from the nucleus. Okay? So if you had, like hydrogen, one electron, its home base, it's what we call its ground state, would be at the lowest possible energy level. It would be at energy level 1, or n equals 1. Okay? So this one we've already seen. The farther up, if it were able to absorb some energy, maybe an electrical current was run through it, maybe it absorbs some sunlight, whatever it may be, uh, it, its electrons are able to jump up to different energy levels, and then, as they fall back down, emit photons. And depending on which energy levels they fall between, um, will determine whether or not we see UV. Well, we won't see it, but whether or not UV light is emitted, infrared, or as uh, we found in the Balmer series, visible light. All right. So <clears throat> the second energy, excuse me, the second um, quantum number is called a sublevel. All right. So we have an energy level, which we've already been talking about uh, when we we're describing light and how that works. Um, but now, sublevel, I want you guys to think of it a different way. I want you to think about it in terms of a shape, it being a shape, all right? And so we have four different shapes of these electron clouds. So these clouds can come in a variety of sizes, and all of those sizes correspond to the energy level. See, the problem with the just looking at the ring structure, the way Bohr had it laid out, is that it seems to us as if the electrons exist in a two-dimensional space. 
Okay? In fact, it's three-dimensional. So it's not circular, circular, it's in fact spherical for one of them. And then the wave equation calculated several different shapes, um, each of them getting more and more complex and with that more energetic. So the sublevels, which are represented by a letter, ironically the shape, it's, it, the quantum number is a letter, um, but the shape is described by a letter. And now you can describe it any way you want, whatever you think the shape looks like. I always try to make the uh, letter that's associated with that shape kind of match up, and I'll show you what we do here. Um, but here are the four different shapes. We have S, P, D, and F. And they do have, there is a reason why they named it, for example, um, S is spherical, P is polar because it goes along each of the three axes in three-dimensional sp three space, X, Y, and Z. Um, D, uh, D and F, I'm not 100% sure, uh, about its, their origins, but um, you can kind of make something up. Whatever helps you remember, it works for me. All right, so the S sublevel, and again, sublevel really, in my head, I think shape. It'll be, it's called sublevel, but I think of the shape. So the first quantum number is its energy level. That's how big it is. That's how big the cloud is. The second one simply describes um, the shape of that cloud. Okay, so the first least energetic type, the most simple type, is an S. Okay, and it's a sphere, like you can see here. The next one is the P sublevel, and that's a dumbbell shape, or as if you've seen drawn here, what helps me kind of remember, I think of it like a peanut, uh, P for peanut, S for sphere, okay? And you can see it kind of has a figure eight shape. And then the next one is the D sublevel, and I actually thought, even though it is, typically it is a four-leaf clover, uh, and this may not be uh, correct, I wouldn't want to run into a botanist on this, but, um, I always think D for daisy because it kind of has a flower shape. And then the last one is a really complex shape. Um, and these can get really, really bizarre and interesting looking um, with kind of donuts and things coming out of there. Um, and all these are are basically areas around the nucleus where electrons have a high probability of being at any given point. That's it. So if I said that there's an electron in the first energy level in an S sublevel, what that means is that I have an electron that is, I'm about 90% sure at any given point is somewhere in that three-dimensional space. I can never know exactly where it is, and that is quantum physics. I like this picture a little bit better, uh, simply because you're able to see the different things in 3D space. So you can see the first one is a sphere, um, second one, that peanut shape, the P sublevel up above here, is <clears throat> sort of also in three-dimensional space. Now you can see the uh, D on the top right. And then the F is too, really too complicated to try to use the same software to describe it. So you typically see a bunch of drawings when it comes there. So there's S, P, D, and F. Right? Now each of these shapes, like I said, can correspond to a different energy level. So an S sublevel can be in the first energy level. It can be in the second energy level. It can be in the third. It's going to be the same shape because it's an S. It's a sphere. The same thing would be true of all, you know, the P. But as we increase the energy level, all that happens is the shape simply gets larger. So the last thing that we want to kind of mention with regards to these sublevels, and actually this is a lead into the next, um, the next quantum number, is this idea that some of these, as these shapes get more and more complex, they can actually be arranged differently in space. So take the P sublevel, for example. It's a kind of peanut or dumbbell shaped, but it can exist on the x-axis. So going sort of left to right, you can you know, imagine this in space where you're kind of like holding, you have something going from left to right, and then you have the same shape going top to bottom, right? It's going top to bottom, and then you have one coming straight out at you, uh, and that's the Z. So they have different orientations, and that's actually the third quantum number. So I'm going to kind of keep re, uh, rehashing this as we go. The first energy level describes the size of this electron cloud. The, the second quantum number is the sublevel, and it describes the shape of the electron cloud. The third quantum number describes the orientation of that shape uh, of the cloud. Okay. Um, when you look at the D orbital, you can see that it has five different orientations, all right? Now, 
obviously, if, you, if you're just looking at these shapes here on the left side of the screen, it's pretty complicated, right? These are not easy to see. Um, these are not easy to visualize. And it, you might guess correctly that these are high energy orbitals. So it takes a lot of energy to, to exist. For an electron to be in one of these really complex shapes like a D or even an F, um, it requires quite a bit of energy. Not only do they begin a little bit farther away from the nucleus, for example, uh, you won't find a D sublevel. There's not enough, there's physically not enough room for a D sublevel until you get out to the third energy level. The first two energy levels, or the first energy level, will, and we'll see this in a little bit, will only have an S. It's only got room for an S. The second energy level is big enough to hold an S and a P. And the third energy level, finally, you have enough room for an S shape, uh, all three of the P shapes, and all five of these D shapes. The sphere, even though we didn't mention it, um, the sphere has only one orientation. Hold up a volleyball or a basketball and spin it around. Does anything ever change? No. So you can't orient a sphere differently. So the sphere has one. Okay. The uh, P sublevel has three different orientations. Okay. And then the uh, five for the D sublevel. Okay. All right. Here's the F. Uh, again, really a little bit more going on there. This is why you have to simply draw them out. It's pretty tough to do it with uh, computer graphic software. Um, so we just draw these out. Um, you're never going to have to draw these for a test, for a quiz, for any reason whatsoever. But what you do need to know is that there are seven possibilities um, of or, or arrangements of this shape. So if you think about it, we have one for the S, three for the P, five for the D, seven for the F. So they increase. They're always odd numbers, and this is important, actually. Um, they're always odd numbers, and they're simply increasing. Starting at 1, they increase by 2 every time. All right? Now, these things, obviously, if you have atoms, you know, we have atoms with, you know, take uranium, 92 electrons in it, right? Where do those go? If you only have 7 energy levels, where are they going? Well, the reality is that <clears throat> they are overlapping, okay? They are overlapping and combining. So if you look here... This doesn't show you, there would be a first energy level in this image right here that's also full. There would be a, a 1s, there would be a smaller sphere tucked inside there. But here, in each of those different um, orbitals, okay, each variation of a sublevel is called the orbital. In each of those, you can put exactly two electrons. So just in the second energy level, okay, so if you take it and you look, we have... Um, I'll just go down here, okay, so if you're looking right here, we have this big energy level, okay, right here, this S, this 2S, so there'd be two electrons in that space, okay? there would be two electrons in this one, there could be two electrons in this one, and finally, two electrons in this one. That's just in the second energy level. And so that would be a total of eight electrons in that energy level. Underneath it, you would have two electrons in the 1s. So every orbital, every orientation of a shape possesses two electrons, and they overlap, just like you see here. So let's look at each of them, all right? In every energy level, right, we can put, because energy levels you know, increase in size as you get farther away, they're able to accommodate more room to squeeze in some of these different sublevels. In the first energy level, it's big enough to hold an S. In the second energy level, it can hold uh, an S and a P. And of course, the 1S would be underneath it, already filled up. In the third energy level, you can hold an S, a P, a D, uh, and, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. In the fourth energy level, you can have uh, an S, a P, a D, and finally an F. So there's enough space to hold all seven of the different F orbitals uh, in there. And in the fifth energy level, you can also uh, hold it. And that's the, the same holds true. There is nothing beyond, at least not yet, there is nothing beyond, unless we can figure out a way to get these atoms larger with more electrons, um, but they tend to not be very stable with that many protons in their nucleus. Um, we can only hold up to that F sublevel. So there would be the same thing, 6S, 6P, 6D, 6F, 
and the same thing for 7. All right? So in each of the orientations, in each of these orbitals, okay, which is our third quantum number, okay, we can hold two electrons. All right, and I'll go back so you guys can write that down. Um, so when we look at all of the possibilities, okay, you look at all of the different energy levels, all of the different sublevels that are allowed in those energy levels, and when you realize that take like a D, let's say you have a D sublevel in energy level three. Well, there are five orbitals or five ways that you can take that D shape and arrange it. And again, this isn't like artistic imagination. This is calculated from Schrodinger's wave equation. Um, and it's able to hold two electrons for each of those orbitals. So again, take that D sublevel. You can get 10 electrons in the D sublevel because there are five different orientations and two electrons go in each one. So a D sublevel can hold 10 electrons. Okay? An F sublevel, as you might imagine, can hold a bit more. So let's break this down. Okay? In the S sublevel, because there's only one orientation, you only have one, um, one opportunity to put those two electrons in there. So an S can only hold a, two electrons. The P can hold up to six electrons because it has three different orientations, right? We showed you one on the x-axis, one on the y, one on the z. In each of those orbitals, you can put two electrons. So three times two, six. D, we just said, has five different orbitals, and so it can hold up to 10 valence electrons. Not valence, excuse me, we'll get to that later. Um, and then F can hold up to 14. In theory, if there was a G, it would keep going, but so far, not in existence. Always remember, guys, if I've just skipped ahead, go back. Um, I know sometimes you have to write a little bit more, but I'm not going to sit here with blank silence and try to guess how long it's going to take you to jot it down. So just hit pause and then go back and uh, pause it so you can see the screen. All right. So <clears throat> orbitals for any um, sublevel are, remember, they're the same shape. Right? They're the same shape. An S is always a sphere. The P always has the three different, um, the same shape with the different orientation for the sort of that dumbbell or peanut shape. The D, remember I said daisy, has five different shapes. But they're going to always be a different size. So a 2P is smaller than a 3P. Okay? Not only that, but the, the different orientations or orbitals can vary within there, with the exception of the S, which only has one orbital. All right? All right, so now total electrons, how do we do it? In the first energy level, because it only holds an S, and because S only holds uh, one orientation or one orbital, and every orbital can hold two electrons, you see you gotta take it back here a little bit, um, it can only hold, the first energy level is only capable of holding two electrons. So that first uh, energy level, the one that's closest to the nucleus, in any atom is only capable of holding on to two electrons. The second energy level can accommodate a bit more. It can uh, hold on two from the S and then six electrons coming from the three P orbitals that are in that energy level. Remember, each orbital can hold two and because P has three different orientations or arrangements, uh, you can squeeze a total of six in there. All right? The third energy level allows all three so you get an S, a P, a D, and an F. And now, so that's 2, 6, and then 10 from that D sublevel. Um, there's five different orbitals, each orbital holding 2. Again, 5 times 2 is 10. So a D sublevel can hold up to 10 electrons. The fourth energy level, and then 5th, 6th, and 7th beyond, are each capable of holding 32. So if you add all those up, if you have, you know, something really large, uh, you know, that has 100 electrons, you can see how... There's room for it. We can show you where each of those electrons could find a home. Right? And well, when we get into the next little bit here on electron configuration, what we end up doing is kind of using these quantum numbers to describe where the, elect where the electrons fill. So let's say you had something that had uh, 15 electrons. You could actually write down, using the quantum numbers, the location of all 15 electrons. And that's exactly what we do. And it helps us understand things like uh, valence electrons, ions, covalent bonding, uh, hybridization, which we won't do in here, but you may do in college if you get there. So in general, 
when we're filling those electrons in, the simplest one tends to fill first. They're kind of like human beings, all right? Even though electrons disobey a lot of the rules, they do kind of obey the rules of laziness. And that is, in nature, uh, things tend to take the easiest route. So an electron, if it has the option, will always fill the least energetic sublevel. It'll always fill, or shape, it'll always fill the S before it fills a P, and it'll fill a P before it fills the D, and D before the F. So electrons are a little easy to understand that way. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how to use the periodic table, and it's a really, really easy thing. That's the thing. This stuff sounds really complicated, but the tool, once we um, get your periodic table set up, is a piece of cake to be able to figure out these electron configurations or to describe the location of all of our electrons in any given atom. All right, that is it. I have no slide over here. So um, let's make sure that if you need to go back and rewatch this, I have no doubt that you will. Um, that's a lot of information I just threw out at you. Um, rewatch it, uh, use your notes, feel free to work together. Um, and then, of course, on Haiku, please check out the, um, please check out your <clears throat> answer key uh, for the worksheet that you pick up in class because uh, you don't want to keep going down a road getting confused uh, and, you know, create some bad habits. Fix the problems immediately. When you're done with that, uh, there's um, a really good TED Talk that I threw on Google Classroom. Go check that out and um, I will pull some questions from there for your quiz, which by the way is next Thursday. So I'm hoping everyone is watching currently. All right, be good to the sub. Thanks guys.